Amen. Well, good to see you this morning. Thank you for being here in the morning service. And I have enjoyed everything that's going on here this morning. The good Sunday school hour and the singing. Thank you for that good song. And I appreciate the goodness of the Lord, don't you? Amen. I've heard a lot said about 2021 and 2020 and all those things. And Boy, it's all true what's been said, but I'm glad the Lord does not change. Amen. Old uh, preacher by the name of um, Earl Hughes, I was in a meeting with him down in, of all places, Looneyville, West Virginia. That was the name of it, and he was preaching in the tent meeting. And I don't remember what all he preached on all, the, all of it, but he made a statement in the middle of it. He said, you don't have a single problem the one trip to heaven wouldn't cure. And that's the truth right there. Amen. And uh, I've kind of got heaven on my mind a little bit this morning. So I want you to turn to Revelation chapter number four, the book of the Revelation chapter number four. And uh, I say again, I appreciate that good Sunday school hour. And uh, I like to hear Papa preach in Sunday school. Amen. And uh, I like a man who studies and has something to say when he gets up. And I appreciate that. And then has a heart about it too. And I want to thank you for praying for our family. And uh, uh, Papa's in heaven. And we look forward to seeing him again one of these days. John gets a look in heaven in Revelation chapter 4. He says, After this I looked and behold a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. We're in Revelation 4, now verse 2. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. There was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like an em unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The first beast was like a lion and the second beast like a calf. The third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. When those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crown, crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. We'll keep reading a little bit. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within, and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven or in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereon. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. 
And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by Thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb which was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read Revelation 4 and Revelation 5, and really probably the first time that I ever read it, I thought to myself, these are some strange things. These are things I've never seen. These are things I've never thought of. These beasts full of eyes, these, these unusual things going on when John got a look into heaven. And sometimes when we think about heaven and the things the Bible says about it, there are things that are not familiar to us. I remember talking to a little girl one time who was a saved little girl. I was talking to her about heaven and I was surprised to find that she was not the least bit excited about going to heaven. As a matter of fact, when she had heard about heaven, the things that she heard were somewhat frightening to her. And the reason they were frightening is because they were unfamiliar. I've never seen beasts like we read about here, full of eyes. I've never seen walls of, of jasper, and I've never seen gates of pearl. A lot of things I read about in heaven I've never seen. But the truth of the matter is, heaven for the Christian will be a familiar place. You know what? The truth of the matter is, heaven, when we think about it, seems a lot like home. You know what makes home a wonderful place? The things that are familiar there. That's what makes home wonderful. I think about when I was a boy uh, growing up in my home, my four brothers, my mom and dad, and uh, things that would go on around Christmas time. And then I, I grew up and I moved away and we would go home at Christmas time and come and, and uh, see my dad had gone on to be the Lord now and my mother was there and we would come home and my, my, my three brothers and their wives and nieces and nephews and we would gather around and what made it a wonderful thing about going home was the things we were familiar with. My mama loved, uh, she was always involved with the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes. You've heard of that, right? She never won. But because she kept writing in, you know, they'd send her something and she'd send them something back, fill out something, and they'd send her these little, these little uh, gifts. Are you familiar with that? Sometimes it'd be a little calendar. Sometimes it'd be a little uh, knife that was so dull you couldn't, you couldn't cut butter with it. Sometimes it'd be a, a, a little fingernail clipper that didn't work or it'd be an ink pen. Most of those didn't work. There'd always be some little gift that came along. And what was interesting about those gifts is at Christmas time, my mama was always careful about uh, making sure that she spent the same amount of money on everybody so that nobody would get jealous. I don't know that we ever would have got jealous, but apparently she thought we would. And then she always made sure that everybody had the same number of presents to open up. So sometimes after you got a couple presents, you'd get this little present, you'd open it up, and it would be something that, this, that the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes had sent to you, and she just wrapped it up and gave it to you because she didn't want you to feel slighted because you got one less present than somebody else. Well, my mom went to be with heaven, or be with the Lord, went to heaven, be with the Lord. And so the next, the next Christmas... We had the family get together. Mom and dad are both in heaven now, and mom's not been sending in to the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes anymore. 
So we, we exchanged some gifts among the family. And then my two of my brothers, Dave and Jeff, my next oldest and my youngest brother, they brought out this big box. And it said on it, from mom to the boys. And we opened it up. You know what it's full of? Leftover publishers, clearinghouse, sweepstakes, gifts. But you know what it did? It made it seem like home. And like Christmas. Because it was something familiar. So I'm thinking about heaven today. I can't get heaven off my mind. I want to talk to you about some familiar things in heaven. Some things that I'm familiar with. Someone said one time, they said, well, so-and-so is so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. I've never met anybody like that. Been many times in my life I've been so earthly minded, I was no heavenly good. But I've never thought, I've never met anybody that thought too much about heaven. One old Puritan writer said this about heaven. He said, that which will make us most happy when we possess it will make us most joyful when we meditate upon it in this life. Another writer said this, I'm persuaded that is the neglect of this duty, the duty of considering heaven. I'm persuaded that is the neglect of this duty, which so commonly makes death even to godly men unwelcome and uncomfortable. C.H. Spurgeon said about death for the Christian. He said, for the Christian, death is not the house. Death is just the porch that leads into the house. We have a house in heaven. So I'm thinking about heaven. You say, preacher, why, why should heaven be familiar to us? Well, there are three things I'll say to you and then I'll be done. I want to say to you, first of all, I am familiar with the prince that governs heaven. I'm familiar with the Lord. I will, not be, I will not be confused about who's in charge because I already know Jesus. It'll not be a stranger who rules over me in heaven and governs my life because he's been doing that in this life. Some folks, they talk about, I want to go to heaven, but they wouldn't enjoy heaven at all because they don't let the Lord rule their life now. They don't give him any glory now. They don't pay any attention to him now. Heaven will, be not, will not be a familiar place to them. When John thinks about heaven and he looks into heaven, the very first thing he sees is the Lord Jesus seated upon the throne in heaven. So I said, well, preacher, things are out of whack. Things are out of hand. No, Jesus is still on the throne. John saw him there. He hasn't abdicated the throne. John saw him. He said this about him in verse 3. He said, he that sat was to look upon like a jack jasper and a sardine stone. That's interesting because the jasper uh, and the sardine stone were the first and last stones in the breastplate of the priest, the high priest. Jesus is the first and the last, the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. There's no question in John's mind nor in my mind about who it was seated upon the throne in heaven and there ought to be no question on our minds today who's on the throne. Jesus is seated upon the throne in heaven and when when we read about what he did, John will tell us a little bit in verse 5 about this sealed book, this sealed book, sealed with seven seals. And he's talking about, I believe, the title deed to the earth. And he's talking about the redemption and the plan of redemption and the actions involved in redemption. He talks about Jesus and he, and he gives him really three titles in chapter 5. He calls him the lion of the tribe of Judah. He calls him the root of David. And he calls him a lamb as it had been slain. that Those three titles remind us of what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. They remind us as the root of David that he is near of kin to us. In another place in the scripture, Jesus said, I am the root and the offspring of David. You want to talk about someone miraculous. He was before David and after David. He was David's Lord and David's son. There isn't anybody like Jesus. Amen. Nobody as wonderful as he is. Nobody as magnificent magnificent as he is. He was the root and the offspring of David. And the reason that that is important in this passage is because you could not redeem something unless you were related to those who had lost it. And you know what Jesus is? He is near of kin to you and I. He was made in the likeness of men. That's what the Bible said. In the fullness of, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. I think it was Paul said in Philippians, let this mind be in you 
which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Paul said another place without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He's talking about Jesus. He is near of kin to you and I, and so he has the right to redeem the earth. Not only is he called, uh, called the root of David, he is also called this in our passage. He is called the lion. Well, let's talk about the lamb. He's called the lamb that was slain. He paid the purchase price. What did he pay that he might redeem the world? He paid with his own blood. He shed his blood for you and I on the cross of Calvary and redeemed us. And then he's called the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, I like that lion because there's another person in the Bible who is styled as a lion. You remember? Peter said, be sober, be vigilant, your adversary the devil. As a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And in our Bible, the devil's called the God of this world who hath blinded the minds of them that are lost. But you know what? One of these days, <laughs> hallelujah, one of these days, that lion of the tribe of Judah, the true lion, the real lion, is going to kick that other lion off the throne of this world and he's going to he is going to redeem. He's already redeemed it to us. But one of these days in our experience, we will know we'll see the devil cast in the lake of fire and the lion of the tribe of Judah will put him down forever. I'm glad that day is coming. I'm familiar with this man. I, by the way, I'm not preaching on this, but I'll mention it. He stood as a, that, the Bible said that lamb that was slain was standing. Did you ever think about that? Slain animals don't stand. But this animal that has been slain is standing. That means something's happened to him. That means he got up from the grave. That means he's conquered death. I am familiar with this prince. You familiar with him? I'll tell you what I'm familiar with about Jesus. I'm familiar with his love. I know he loves me. For God so loved the world. Jesus loves us. First song we learned when we were in Sunday school. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. And that's the truest song that you'll ever hear. It's a truth. Somebody said, preacher, teach me some deep truth. Here's a deep truth. Jesus loved you and died on the cross for you and shed his blood that you might be born again and spend eternity with him in heaven. I'm familiar with his love. I'm familiar with his life. I know how he lived. He lived a perfect life. He never sinned. Peter said of him who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. His heavenly father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Even Pilate said, I find no fault in him. I've been spending the last 40 years studying about his life, uh, listening to his words, seeing how he lives. So when I get to heaven, I won't be surprised at what he has to say. I won't, it won't be unfamiliar to me to hear his voice. I've been listening to him for these years. I'm familiar with his leadership. I know what it's like to have him lead my life and guide me. I know what it's like to look to him uh, for instruction. And so it won't be an unfamiliar thing to me when I get to heaven and I get before the throne and I look toward him that I might know what to do next. I, that will not be unfamiliar. I, I think about times in my life when it just seemed like the Lord just seemed like he impressed me about things. And I, I know, I know that we look in the Bible, we find our, we find our leadership from what he said in the word of God, but sometimes he'll take the Bible and he'll just kind of impress our hearts. You know what I'm talking about? There have been times in your life when God just impressed you about things. I don't know how to explain it. I just know he does. One fellow said, did you hear an audible voice? And the other fellow said, no, it was louder than that. I remember I was preaching one time in Ambassador Baptist Church down in Hudson, North Carolina, and I had three points. You know, you know me, I preach here, I'm a three-point preacher most of the time. And uh, I had three good points. I mean, three good ones. And I got done with the first point, and the Lord said to me in my heart, that's enough. Shut it down. And I didn't want to. I had two, I had two more good points. What are you going to do with two leftover points? You can't put them in the microwave and eat them up. What are you going to do with them? But I quit, like the Lord said. I just closed her down. I said, well, I, that's all tonight. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And I said, if you're lost, you need to be saved. You come. And seven people come and got saved that night. Not born again. 
I think it was that same night that a lady called. She was down in the nursery living over the, listening over the speaker and she left out the side door and she got about halfway home and she stopped. This is before cell phones now. You parents can explain this to your kids later. She got into a phone booth and got on the phone and called the preacher and said, I'm under conviction. I need to be saved. And he led her to the Lord over the phone. In that same meeting, on, that was on a Sunday, and on Monday, one of the boys, one of the little boys in the public school, they were having show and tell, and he took his mother, who had got saved that night, or that Sunday morning, to show and tell, and let her give her testimony, show and tell in the public school. Amen. That's pretty good. I'm just saying, yeah, I'm familiar with his leadership. How about you? Heaven will not be an unfamiliar place to me, because I'm familiar with the person that governs there. But then let me say to you, secondly, heaven will not be an unfamiliar place to us, most of us, hopefully all of us, because we're familiar with the population that is gathered there. We're going to, we're going to see faces. The Bible talked about knowing even as we are known. And there is, a, there is an aspect of our eternity in heaven where the Bible said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not... Uh, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And there's an aspect of our Christian, our eternity in heaven, that we're going to be like Jesus. But yet, I, I, I know that, that it also when, when, uh, Mo, when Jesus stood on the Mount of Transfiguration and Moses and Elijah were there, and the disciples recognized them. I don't know how exactly they recognized them, but they knew them. And I think we will know one another in heaven. Brother Kelly used to sing, I will not be a stranger when I get to that city. I'm acquainted with folks over there. And I'm going to tell you, I'm acquainted with some folks over in heaven. We sent a, we sent a good one to heaven here uh, on Monday. The Lord took one of our dearest home. And I'm acquainted with those folks that are in heaven. I'm acquainted with what, what how they lived. And, I, and so when I get there, I'm not going to feel like I'm a stranger. I, I go to places where I'm a stranger. I go to places where I've never been. And, uh, and sometimes it's awkward. I, I don't know why I'm thinking about this right now, but I, I went to a church I'd never been to before. It's a large church. I don't know, maybe 400 people. And, and uh, Sherry and I were there and I had uh, a suit jacket on a, over, a, over a, a hanger and I had a, a coat that I'd wore outside and I had that suit jacket on the hanger and there were two different ties that I wear with that, with that suit jacket and and one of those ties was still on that hanger. So when I got out of the van, I took my overcoat off and I slipped on my jacket and I didn't realize it, but that tie that was on that hanger got caught in the jacket and it was up in my sleeve and the bottom of it was hanging out of my coat like that. And so I was walking in, you know, and I'm shaking hands, people I've never seen before. The only one I know there's a pastor. I'm shaking hands. I don't know. I got a tie hanging out from underneath my jacket. And we get in there and it's morning service and the preacher said, now let's come come up and all the men come up and have a word of prayer around the altar. So I get up, you know, I'm just going to the altar and I, I happen to look back and Sherry's going, Brian, 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 Brian. and I, so I, I come back. I said, what's the matter? She said, you got a tie hanging out of your jacket. And so I pulled it out of my jacket and set it down, went back up and prayed. And then when we come back somewhere during the service, we had a little time of fellowship and this lady come over and she was grinning. She said, I saw that tie hanging out of your husband's jacket. She said, I didn't say anything. I thought it was some new fad that they were starting. But uh, I, I go to places where I'm unfamiliar with people. And I don't, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know who they are. And you want, you want to make a good impression, you know, and some time. I feel like I make a better impression if I just don't say anything. So I just keep quiet. I, I'm uncomfortable. But I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> when I get to heaven, I'm going to be surrounded with folks that I know and folks that I love. I'm going to be surrounded with people that I am familiar with. Folks that I've spent time with. I, folks that I, have, that I have lived with. But not only that, I'm going to know people. I'm going to know people in heaven that I never knew down here. You so what I mean, preacher? I'm going to meet some people that I'm familiar with that I've never met. How can you be familiar with somebody you never met? Well, I tell you, I've already walked by the Red Sea with Moses. Are you listening now? I've been to Mount Moriah with Abraham. Uh -huh. I've been digging wells with Isaac. I've been, I've been down in the pit with Joseph. I've been in the Bible. You've been in your Bible. I feel like I know those people. 
You feel that way? Oh, somebody said, well, preacher, I know this when he plays ball and all that. Well, I, that's fine. I'm not kicking off on that. But I know, I know some folks. I'm going to meet some folks. I know them as though I have walked with them through this life because I spent time reading about them and studying on and their lives have had an effect on my life. I'm going to meet him. I wrote a few of them down. I thought about this. I've been on the mountain with Elijah. I've been in the furnace with Hebrew children. I've been in the pit and the prison, the palace with Joseph. I've been on the ark with Noah. I've been at the Fort Jabbok with Jacob when he wrestled with God. I've been in the tent door with Abraham. I, I know these folks. I, I'm familiar with them. And one of these days I'm going to see them face to face. I'm going to meet them. Uh, maybe I'll sit down with Moses and talk about what that Red Sea was like. And you know, here's what I wonder sometimes. I wonder if they know about my preaching and I wonder what they think about it and I wonder if Moses will say well now Brian you didn't exactly get that part right I don't know I wonder if one of them will say to me you know you didn't paint me in a very good light down there I don't know what it'd be like but I'm you say well preacher that's all just no I'll tell you what it is that's the reality because these are not fairy tales. These are not myths. This is not the figment of somebody's imagination. Peter talked about, he said, we've not followed cunningly devised fables. These were real people. I've preached about Ruth so many times I feel like I'm related. And I'm going to talk to her about what it was like in those days. Heaven's going to be wonderful. It's going to be a familiar place. I'm familiar with the prophets and people of the Bible. I'm familiar with preachers that are there. I've known great men of God. Brother Billy Kelly's over there. Brother John Jackson. Brother Jack Grigsby. Brother Grigsby, I'd go and preach for him and I'd come and, and I'd sit down with him and he'd say, have you ever thought about this? And he'd take me on a trip through the Bible. I sat down one time with him and he said, you ever thought about feed in the Bible? And before I could answer, he took me on a trip through the Bible, talking about feet and there was and what, what they represented and about redemption. And he, he took me over there to the to Deuteronomy about the, the man that had to lose his shoe. And he took me over there to Ruth. And he took me up on the mountain when the elders went up there and they looked at God, they saw the Lord God and they saw under his feet a, a smooth work of brass. And he just started talking about feet. And he took me over there to the New Testament where where the where the prodigal son came home and they put shoes on his feet and he talked about the one how beautiful are the feet of them which preach the gospel of glad tidings and he just took me through feet in the Bible I'm going to see him again one of these days I'm going to see those preachers that I've loved I'm going to see some people they weren't preachers and they weren't prophets they were just precious people that love God I'm going to see Papa Pitt one of these days I'll see my mother and I'll see my father I'm going to see I'm going to see folks that I've known over the way that just loved the Lord, cared about Him. And I'm not going to be a stranger when I get there. I was thinking about a passage of Scripture in the Old Testament. I wrote it down. It's Jeremiah. It's an unusual passage. Here's what it said. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured. Why don't you think about that? Now, he may be talking about the first heaven. He may be talking about the second heaven. He may be talking about the third heaven. I don't know. But he said, if heaven could be measured, you ever think about it, how could you measure heaven? Now, I know the new Jerusalem, the city can be measured. We have the measurements in the book of Revelation. But heaven itself. And this is what I thought of. I thought you can't measure an eternal redeemer. You cannot measure an endless refrain. I'll talk to you about that in a moment. But I thought about this. You cannot measure an everlasting reunion. Did you ever go to a family reunion? I haven't been to one in a long time. But we used to go to family reunions. We'd, we'd play ball sometime. And, of course, they'd bring food. and We'd have a little picnic. We'd be out at the park. And you spend all day long there. And then you pack it up and getting ready to go. And, and invariably, this is what will happen. You get in the car and you start to drive away. And somebody say, you know what? I never got to speak to Aunt Mary. I never even got, I never even got to speak or spend any time with Uncle John. We miss somebody. But we're going to a reunion where we're never going to run out of time. There'll never be an ending to it. It'll be eternal and forever. You can't measure something like that. And that'll be a glad day. I'm familiar with the prince that governs that city. I'm familiar with the people that have gathered there. And then I'll say this to you and I'll be done. 
I'm familiar with the practices that go on there. You know what? It won't be a shock to my system to get to heaven and hear them shouting. That will not shock me. I've seen that. You don't have to shout every time you come to church, but it wouldn't hurt you. I remember preacher Little, he pastored the Pine Bluff Baptist Church, and his name was Little, Wallace Little, and, and, uh, and he was Little. He's a small man. And I went to a meeting one time, and Brother Little said to me, he, he was an elderly man at that time. He's in heaven now. He said, Brother McBride, he said, you should have been in the service. And he named whatever night it was. And I said, what happened? He said, four young fellas just got full of the Holy Ghost, and they got to shouting and carrying on. I said, what'd you do, Brother Willis? Or Brother Little? He said, I went over and got in the middle of them and said, Lord, pour some out on me. <laughs> he didn't mind a little shouting. I don't mind a little shouting. I believe God's worth us praising Him vocally. Amen. I believe, he's, we're, I believe we ought to shout. I'll be familiar with the shouting. Here's what Peter said. Whom having not seen, you love. In whom though now you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. I like that, that joy unspeakable. That's when you don't know what to say. You just have to say, glory! Hallelujah! Praise God! Isn't he good? I like that kind of stuff. You don't have to do it every time, and not everybody worships like that, but that's the way it looks to me like that's the way they're worshiping in heaven. A loud voice. I'm familiar with the shouting. I'm familiar with the sayings. Listen to what they say. They say, Thou art worthy to take the books and open the seals there, or the book, open the seals there, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God. You know what they're saying? They're saying it was him and not me. It was all Him. It was what Jesus did. It's what you did, Lord. It's not what we did. A lot of folk, when they testify, they want to tell you what they did. I'll tell you what let's do. Let's not tell anybody what we did. Let's tell everybody what He did. Let's tell everybody how good Jesus was and what He did for us on the cross of Calvary. I'm familiar with the singing over there. They're singing. That's what it says. The Bible said, and they sung a new song. And it tells us what that song is. Everybody has a favorite song. Sometimes we'll, we'll get to churches and, and, uh, and, and they'll say, sing such and such a song. They don't very often ask ones that I sing, but they do ask for favorite songs. And they'll say, sing this song. And somebody will slip a little paper, piece of paper and say, sing this song. And, uh, and sometimes one fellow said, sing my favorite song. I have no idea what his favorite song was. Sometimes they're too general. They say, sing that song about the Lord. We got several of those. I remember one time we were picking before the service. We got done playing, I'll fly away. And the fellow in the front row, and he kind of waved at me. The service hadn't started. And he waved at me. I said, yeah. He said, do you know I'll fly away? I said, yes, sir. He said, would you play it? So we played it again. I don't know if you recognize it or not. But here's something I thought about in this verse. Everybody has the same favorite song in heaven. Down here, we all have a different favorite. If you do, sometimes, I don't know if you ever do this here, but I've been in church where they say, tell you what, let's do. Somebody give me a favorite out of the hymn book, we'll sing it. And somebody say, well, 256, or, or uh, in the songbook I grew up with, 256 was Amazing Grace, and then 67 was, uh, um, oh, now I can't think of what it was. Uh, Anyway, I, I used to know what it was because we sang it every, every midweek mi uh, service. But uh, um, I won't even try to remember because I can't remember. It'll come to me tonight while I'm asleep. I'll wake up and think of it. And then I won't remember why I was trying to think of it. But everybody has a favorite, a favorite song. But in heaven, we get done singing this one. And somebody said, what do you want to sing next? And everybody said, you know, that last one was good. That one about Jesus and what he did for us. Let's sing that one again. I'm familiar with those songs. And let me say this, and I, I think I'll be done. I'm familiar. I'm talking about the practices that go on in heaven. I'm familiar, and we ought to be familiar, and we should be more familiar with the service, the serving that goes on. A lady said to me one time, she said, Preacher, I, I don't know about about heaven because it looks like we don't ever do anything except worship the Lord. Well, 
That sounds pretty good to me. But the Bible says this in Revelation 22, 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. I'll tell you what we're going to do in heaven. We're going to serve Him. I don't know exactly how we're going to serve Him. Maybe our service consists of this worship. But we're going to serve Him somehow. That ought not be unfamiliar to us. It ought be easy for us to step from this world in the next world because it's not going to be a new vocation. We're going to just go on with what we've been doing. Serving Him. Serving Him. One old Puritan writer, I quoted some Puritan writers before we started, the old Puritan believers. One of them said this. He made this statement. I want you to listen to it. He said, "'Tis folly to dream of heaven when every step is on the path to hell. And what he was saying was, it's a waste of time for you and I, you or I, to think about what heaven will be like if down here every step we take is toward hell rather than toward heaven. If our life is filled with this world and wickedness and sin and ungodliness, then it would be folly for us to even think about heaven. Somebody said, well, I prayed a prayer. I'm glad you did. But what, it, what happened with your life? Well, preacher, I got baptized. Okay. But what happened with your life? Say, well, preacher, I go to God. Okay. I'm glad you do. But what about your living Heaven won't be a familiar place if you've been living, if you've been living like the devil all, it's all your life. There must be repentance and faith before you can have any hope of heaven. So he said, preacher, I don't understand repentance. It's pretty simple. You was headed one way, now you're headed the other way. You had one way of thinking, now you have a different way of thinking. You were in one frame of mind, now you're in a different frame of mind. You were one thing, now you're something else. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Paul talked about how in times past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the Gentiles. He said, that's the way you used to walk, but you got saved and you don't walk that way anymore. You made a change or maybe more precisely, God made a change in you. You got saved and your life is not what it used to be. And so if you trusted Christ and God changed your life, you have hope of heaven. And heaven won't be unfamiliar. And it really is true. The things we think about in this life, the reason we're discouraged about them is because we get wrapped up thinking this life is all there is. But this life is but a vapor. It appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. But we're headed for an eternal home in heaven. And it's going to be a wonderful day. But the only way you can go is if you're bought by the blood of Christ, washed in his blood, saved, repentance and faith. Paul said, everywhere I go, here's what I preach. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you repented and believed the gospel? If you have, you have a wonderful home to look forward to. I want you to bow your heads a moment, if you will. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. I'm glad there's a heaven. I'm glad. You know, if you're saved, this is the worst world you'll ever live in. It only gets better. But if you're lost, this is the best world you live in. It only gets worse. I think about Papa Pitt. I, I know when I study my Bible, there's no time in heaven. But from our side of things, this would be Papa's first have first Sunday in glory. And I thought about John on the Isle of Patmos saying, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. I'd say Papa's probably in the Spirit today on the Lord's Day. I'm glad there's a heaven, aren't you? Could I say this to you, Chris, if you're discouraged? And I don't blame you if you are. 2020 was something. 2021 is going to be something. I don't blame you if you are, but you don't have to be this morning. Heaven is our home. 
We're not an earthly people. We're a heavenly people. Our conversation is in heaven. Let's live in view of heaven in this world. Now, maybe there's somebody here you've never been saved. There's only two alternatives, heaven or hell. Only two places, only two destinies, only two eternities, heaven or hell. The saved go to heaven, the lost go to hell. Where will you go? Today, if you receive Christ as your Savior, heaven can be your home. If you say, preacher, I'm sick of this life of sin. I want Jesus. I want to be saved. I want to be clean. I want to be right. He'll save you today. Would there be anybody this morning you say, preacher, I don't know if I died, I'd go to heaven, but I sure want to. I'd sure like to get that settled today. Would you pray for me? Nobody's looking but me. You lift your hand and say, preacher, pray for me. I don't know I'd go to heaven if I die, but I want to and I want to get it settled. Anybody like that? Now, Father, you help us today. Help us to live in this world in the light of the next world. Help us to set our affections on things above, not on things of this world. Help us to think of the eternal rather than the temporal. And help us ever to be expecting to see your face at any moment. The Bible said, Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Thank you for the promise of heaven. Thank you for what the truth of heaven does in our lives. Help us now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet a moment.